I think we're going to move swiftly on to our next tour, which is from Becky Desjardins, uh, which is a tour of uh, uh, a priceless objects, the special exhibit in honour of Naturalis 200th birthday. I hope you enjoy it. Hello, my name is Becky Desjardins. I'm the senior preparator here at Naturalis Museum. I'm going to give you a tour of our 200 year exhibit, Priceless Object. This exhibit was put together to celebrate our birthday. We're 200 years old. The collection was started by William I in 1820 and through expedition and acquisition has grown to 42 million specimens. We chose 25 of our favorites to be in this exhibit. Many of these objects are really old or really fragile and have either never been on exhibit or not in a really long time. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the challenges of putting together an exhibit like this as well. But uh, in the meantime, let's step into the treasure chest. The first object I'd like to talk about is a toad, the Surinamese toad. The toad, exhibits a really unique behavior in that the female carries the eggs in the skin on her back and they actually hatch out from the skin on her back. This particular example is not very old. It's from the mid 18th century. However, this behavior was first described in a book by Maria Sibylla Miriam in 1705. This is her book here, The Metamorphosis of Surinamese Insects. For those of you not familiar with Miss Miriam's work, she was quite an amazing lady. In 1699, as a divorced 52-year-old mother of four, she traveled with her youngest daughter to Suriname where she spent three years drawing insects, the plants they ate, herpetological specimens, and many other things. And her science and art is to this day considered to be groundbreaking. We're gonna move on to the next object. This is the NTB herbarium and it is at 500 years old, it is one of the oldest objects in our collection. The herbarium is from Bologna, Italy, and it is filled primarily with Italian herbs. However, it does have some American vegetables in it, such as the tomato and the chili pepper, which would have been very rare for this time. Researchers believe that this was meant to be a gift for the Habsburg Emperor Ferdinand I, and indeed, on the front, it says, here for you, a smiling garden of perpetually flowering plants. Now, because this object is so old and fragile, we had to take special considerations with this. The entire exhibit is on a very tight light budget, but research that we've done, the decision was made that this book, the other books and insects, which are so fragile, could only be exposed to 50 lux for one hour every day, that's the maximum, which is why this is a little bit interactive. So when you look at it, you just wipe your hand over the button and the light comes on to really minimize the exposure that this specimen has to light. We're gonna move on down to some geological material. These wooden models were made by the French geologist René Eust Aoui. He was active at the end of the 18th century. He was a crystal, crystallographer, and he was fascinated by how minerals broke. So he would break them down as small as he could and measure the angles and how they broke, and he made sets of these wooden pear wood models, ranging from the most simple to the most complicated crystal structure. He is considered to be the Linnaeus of geology in that he created a true taxonomic tree for crystal Christology, and when he wasn't working on crystals, he helped invent the metric system. Next on our list, we have the spectacular Cape lion. This lion went extinct in the wild in 1865. This specimen is a little older. It came, comes from 1860. What makes this lion different? It's a southern variant of the African lion but it has this mane that covers both the chest and the back. It's very distinctive, this mane. And though this lion is extinct in the wild, it is still found in the Netherlands on our football jerseys, the coat of arms. This is actually the true Dutch lion. 
And I mentioned earlier about the tight light budget for this exhibit. Well, we had to take other things into account as well. For example, temperature and humidity for specimens such as this, and of course, uh, theft. So the glass on this vitrine is extra hard Gorilla Glass. It's totally theft proof. We have minimal vibrations on the floor. The temperature in here is always 21.5 degrees, plus or minus one degrees. And the temperature is 40, or sorry, the humidity is 48%. So we really keep it quite constant in here for these specimens. All right, we're gonna move to the next one, to the elephant bird egg. The elephant bird was discovered, or the first elephant bird egg was found by Westerners in 1850. This specimen is a little bit younger. It came to us for, through a trader in Amsterdam in 1865. And we have two in our collection, and we also have elephant bird bones in our collection. And originally, the elephant bird bones were actually housed with the elephants before researchers realized they were two different things. When I talked to the exhibit designer about how she chose the objects for this collection, she said she worked really closely with the collection managers to find out what specimens really told the story of Naturalis and also what specimens were really spectacular to see. But she did mention that she picked a few specimens that were her favorites, and this is one of them. The next object I'd like to talk about is the meteorite. This meteorite is called the Deep and Vein Meteorite. That's the location where it was found. It's one of only six meteorites to be known to have fallen in the Netherlands, and it fell in 1873. However, it didn't become famous until 2013. This is made from carbon chondrites, this meteorite. Fewer than 0.1% of all meteorites are made of this material. It's really rare, it's considered to be the building blocks of our solar system, so it's incredibly old. It has to be kept in a special airtight box, as you can see here, with silicon beads at the bottom. This is because it's incredibly sensitive to humidity. And you can see we also have a monitor in there to keep really an eye on it. Before this object came to Naturalis, it actually has a pretty interesting story. It was found uh, by somebody who actually saw it fall from the sky. It was given to a local school teacher, he lived for a while, he passed away, his wife it went on to somebody else, that person's wife, he died, the wife gave it to somebody who didn't know what it was. This specimen was almost lost three times before it ended up in the Naturalist collection. But now it gets a lot of visit from researchers, so I'm glad that it was found. And we're gonna move on to a very special marsupial specimen next. This is the gray four-eyed opossum. This specimen is quite old. It was collected by Albertus Seba in the mid 18th century. And, no, I'm sorry, earlier than that. And uh, it was collected in South America. He was a pharmacist who did a lot of collecting. And after he died, Linnaeus came and looked at his collection and described this as a type specimen. A type specimen means that this is the first of its kind to be described for Western science. And this isn't the only object in our collection that was described by Linnaeus. He also visited the herbarium and described some plants there as well. One thing I'd like to mention about this marsupial, you can see that he is in a jar of alcohol. One of the requirements is that when we have alcohol in exhibit, first of all, we can only have so many liters, and second of all, we have to have a empty basin below the specimen in case the jar breaks. This particular vitrine was designed with an empty basin that actually runs the whole length of it just in case we have a real calamity. And who knows, maybe we can reuse this vitrine for future exhibitions. I'm gonna move on from this type to another really interesting type. Here we have a Japanese spider crab. This was not described by Linnaeus, but by the very first director of the museum, Kunrad Jakob Temink. So not only is it special because it was described by Temink, but this actually comes from the collection of Philippe Franz von Siebold. Siebold was a German physician who worked for the Dutch East India Company and was stationed at Dashima in Japan from 1823 to 1829. Siebold was one of the few people who actually lived on the island. This island was the only place in Japan that a Western government had a base, and it was the Netherlands. They were the only Western power that was allowed to trade with Japan at the time. Because Siebold was a permanent employee, as it were, and also a biologist, he was allowed to leave the island and collect on behalf of the Dutch government, which he did. 
When he came back to the Netherlands, when he retired, he brought back 20,000 specimens. They got a lot of visitors these days, both from the Netherlands and from Japan. And Siebold himself is very famous. In Japan, he's in TV shows and written about in manga comics. And for those of you who read the David Mitchell novel, The Thousand Autumns of Jakob de Zoot, he's also a character in that book as well. We're going to go next door and look here at the last quagga. This quagga is the very last one to live. It died in Artis Zoo in 1883. This is a subspecies of the plains zebra, and it was persecuted by colonists to South Africa who believed that it was competing with their grazing animals. They were brought to zoos in Europe, but unfortunately they did not breed well in captivity and they went extinct. Currently, there is a program trying to bring it back through selective breeding, and they have been able to bring back the distinctive brown color, but this for now is the last one. We're gonna move down a little bit further to these two jars. These fish were collected by Dutch military physician and famous ichthyologist Peter Blaker. He collected from the Dutch East Indies while he was stationed there at the end of the 18th century, and he collected and drew over 2,000 fish. And before he died, he was working on an atlas of the fish that he collected, and he completed eight out of 14 volumes. He was a very busy man. He did his own illustrations, and he actually, in addition to these atlases, he wrote 600 articles about the fish that he had collected. After his death, his manuscripts were purchased by Naturalis in 1920, and since then, the rest of the volumes have been published. And then here we have a really special object. This is one of the oldest butterflies in the collection from the Peter Kramer collection. He was collecting on behalf of the Dutch Scientific Committee for Natural History, which was active with the Dutch East India Company. And he described over 1,600 insects, including this one from Borneo. So Peter Kramer's collection after his death was broken up, but after a merger of different Dutch museums in 2011, the specimens were reunited here at Naturalis. So now we're gonna step out to a freestanding vitrine. What happened when we opened, when we designed this exhibit, it was of course done before COVID came. And the idea was we want visitors to feel like they are really in this sort of treasure chamber. It's really special. This room isn't very big, but the original room we had was even smaller. And with COVID regulations, we could only fit in two or three people at a time. And it takes so much time to go through the exhibit that it really became a visitor services nightmare because we had such a long queue. So we had to expand the exhibit and we also put in this freestanding vitrine outside. And that's where we'll go to next. So the next object I would like to show you is the key collection from Franz Jungen. These shells were collected on Java in the mid 18th century. They were collected, there are 940 of them in total, both fossil and modern mollusks. They were brought back to the museum where they were promptly lost for 30 years. When they were rediscovered by the director Carl Martin, it became the starting point for a research program which is still going on this key collection is used to identify shells throughout Southeast Asia, even now. And there's one final object that we'll look at, which is just on the other side. A very special drawer of insects. This drawer of insects was collected by Jewish entomologist Emanuel Speyer during World War II when he was a prisoner at Westerbork camp in Germany and the Schaffelar, which was an internment camp here in the Netherlands. He collected with the help of naturalist researchers who supported him by giving him pins and paper and the other things that he needed. And because he was an entomologist, he was put to work helping with pest outbreaks among the prisoners. Happily, he survived his internment and after the war, he wrote this quote about his time collecting in the camps. Quote, our wonderful field of entomology in this special case has once again demonstrated its ability to further enhance our lives and even the most challenging of circumstances, if only we are willing to exercise that study 
with dedication and love. Well, that is all the stories that I have for you today. I don't have time to show you the auk, the Darwin finches, the dodo, all the other things that we have in this amazing exhibit. Happily, you can still see these stories yourself. We produced an amazing book to go along with the exhibit that has hundreds, I think 300 stories about all the amazing things that we have in the collection, all the objects. And it's only in Dutch. However, online it's in English. So I encourage you to pull up a chair, start up your computer, go to naturalistopstucken.nl, get a cup of coffee and a piece of birthday cake, and help us celebrate 200 years of science in the Netherlands. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you to Matthijs, Kim, and Georgia for your help making this tour. Hello everyone, welcome back and thank you ever so much Becky for your amazing tour. Some incredible objects and some really inspiring stories. So thank you ever so much and I can't wait to come. It's had some uh, great coverage over the last few weeks and months and just looks amazing. Uh, just got a few questions for you. Uh, so Timmy says, I missed the herbarium. What was the date? And she's really interested to hear more about it. So the herbarium dates from 1540. So it's, it's really quite old. It's called the NTB herbarium. And there's actually been a lot of research done on the different, uh, for example, the genetic uh, makeup of the tomato has been done. Tomato has been done through that book. And if you send me a DM, I can tell you all about it. It's also on the Top Stuck website, which by the way, it turns out it is only in Dutch, but it works well with Google Translate. We look forward to finding out more. Sounds brilliant. Uh, so Paolo asks, have there been many problems with the climate control in the gallery? I guess particularly with visitors coming in. That sounds really interesting how you approach that. So far, so good. And uh, this gallery is actually the farthest from the main entrance of the museum, which really helps with keeping it isolated from vibrations and also from climate fluctuations. So yeah, so far I, I haven't heard any stories, but I think, it, I think it's okay. And that Vitrine is also quite uh, uh, solid, so yeah. Sounds very impressive. Uh, next question is, seeing the Seba opossum, is this part of the list, the Duda collection, and do you have any more information on this collector? It is part of that collection, and I do have more information. I saw that question come in, and Simon, I can send you a message, but we do have, we have, a, I think maybe we even have the whole collection from the the, the Ude, I think, so. Yeah, I can definitely get that information. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and from Jo Hatton, not a question, but she just wants to say congratulations for being awarded European Museum of the Year. <laughs> Very much congratulations, well done, it's fantastic. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it was really, it's really been exciting, definitely. We didn't know, at least I as a staff member, uh, we didn't, I didn't know we were even nominated until two days before. And so, yeah, it's really wonderful. And hopefully we'll open up again the 5th of June. How do people feel about it who've worked on the galleries then? We're all really proud because this museum is pretty new. We only opened in 2019 and it was really hard work. I know many of the people attending this conference have also opened museums and it is so much work and this is a huge building. So it's really, really nice to see our work rewarded in that way. So. Yeah, we, we honestly can't wait to come and see. Um, could I ask you a little bit more about how you chose the objects? Because there's some incredible stories, I guess. And what what were some of your near misses? What did you want to put in that you didn't quite get in the cases as well? Oh my gosh. Well, there's, so in the book, we have these 300 stories and all of us who work in collections uh, were approached by the editor saying, what are your personal favorite stories? And that was how the book was created. And then when they were making the exhibit, they went again, okay, what are kind of the best in this book or of these stories that also represent, that show how naturalis uh, kind of fits into the whole world of science. So what really interesting research things have been done here or started here. So that's how they, that's how they picked it. And then of course was also what's really cool to see, you know, something extinct or like the elephant bird egg. Um, my personal highlight, which did not go into the exhibit uh, though it is on exhibit actually somewhere else in the museum, we have a giant ocean sunfish that is from the Netherlands. It is three meters tall and it washed up in the Netherlands in 1870, I think. And it's just so big and so 
cool. And I, I always like to think about what it would have been like to be a person walking on the beach and come across an ocean sunfish that large at that day and age. So I, I'm a, I wish that one was in there, but everything that's in there is great. That sounds excellent. One for the future, maybe, or behind the scenes tours, I'm sure you show everybody that. Uh, well, thank you ever so much. I'm not sure there are any other questions, but I think we've been fairly comprehensive. Uh, honestly, we can't wait to come and see it and come and hear some of the more incredible stories and look forward to when everywhere is a bit more open. Uh, I think that's probably it for this session. Thank you again to Becky, Catherine and Helen. Uh, it's been some brilliant tours and we look forward to watching them.